Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm glad to see everybody here tonight. Our speaker tonight is Matt Huber, and I'll let him introduce himself and his topic after we do some announcements. Two rules of the College of Complexes. One is one fool at a time, and the second one is no personal attacks. That means I can't go early a schmuck, but uh, we'll uh, <coughs> be violated by me at some point. But anyway, um, the format to the college is as follows. First, we have a brief announcements period. The second part is that we'll let our speaker speak, Matt Huber, for up to an hour. Then we'll take questions and answers. And then after that, we'll get a chance to sound off and rebut his speech, depending on how, how much or how, much, how little we do. We generally finish about nine. I'll leave the uh, Zoom call open for anybody who wants to chat afterwards. And, uh, that's basically about it. Okay, Charlie, when you're ready, I'll pull the schedule up and let's do the announcements real quick. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,685 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. As always, a little a reminder here, we have a Google email group uh, with instructions top center of our main website with instructions on how to join that, as well as we offer a meetup group. And a very little traffic um, um, during the week. Uh, remember another bit of business. Will everyone please mute? Please mute so we do not disturb our speaker and show respect. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the video uh, of last week's program by GN uh, on global issues has been added to our lecture library, which you are invited to visit as well uh, in your leisure time. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On October the 1st, there's been a program change we're going to listen to Mr. Joseph Miller, who has declared himself as a candidate for mayor of the city of Chicago. Uh, so we'll, there you can see a narrative, a bio of what led him to run, seek this office. Transitioning into October the 8th, this is going to be on the ballot come November in Illinois, but they're trying to pass a work in incorporate uh, an amendment to the Illinois Constitution called the Workers' Rights Amendment. The Workers' Rights Amendment. So if you are employed for a living, it is important and incumbent that you learn about this, vote for it, and encourage others to do so as well. On October the 15th, we'll be welcoming Illinois State Representative Teresa Ma, who will be enlightening us as to what is going on in the Illinois State Capitol. Um, what are the current issues uh, being looked at um, legislatively on a statewide basis? Please, I, and I hope everyone will be in good behavior. Uh, on October the 22nd, uh, being a civic-minded individual, we will be welcoming the state board chair and other committee officers of the Independent Voters of Illinois who will discuss uh, their endorsements, the, how an endorsement process is undertaken, and other issues pertinent to voting um, in the upcoming election. That leaves October the 29th open. We are under discussion with several speakers tentatively. However, uh, if you would like to speak and haven't done so recently or never done so before, we will always welcome you to speak. I need a title <laughs> and a brief description in order to conform confirm any engagements. 
Anyhow, that's it, Tim. Thank you. Take it away. Hey, and uh, Andrew, if you're uh, Matt, if you're ready, we'll uh, get started. Introduce yourself, and uh, you got the next hour. I'll uh, ask again everybody to mute uh, just so that we can uh, hear our. And what kind of parent lets their 16 year old vape anyway? If I had a 16 year old son, he's like, oh, <laughs> get the fuck out of here, vape. Do some push ups. You ain't got time to vape. You got to do push ups. He's removed. He's removed, so we're good to go. This is, this is going to happen again. I almost can predict this, but go right on. No, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna blast them out quick. So don't worry. <laughs> you know, if they're coming, you know, they're gonna be incoming. Blast them out quick. We know, we know better now. <sighs> Not like the first time it happened. Mm. All right, Matt, the floor is yours, and uh, when you're ready, go ahead. Again, I'm gonna ask everybody to mute while we're. Uh, um, while you're talking, Matt. So uh, all right, I'm going to mute everybody on on the call except you. So go ahead. Uh, you know. Um, so Matt, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks, Charles, for inviting me. And it's a real honor to be part of this incredibly historic series. That's many three thousand something meeting so it's it's really an honor to join you and thank you for coming on a saturday night um okay so i'm gonna i figure with zoom it, it, it's it's better with slides just makes it more interesting so hopefully you all can see this so in the year 2020 a couple of years ago it seemed like things would be different there was yet another catastrophic fire season, record heat and storms, and the U.S. elected a president with the most ambitious uh, climate plan of any candidate in history. His plan was, um, you know, di directly shaped by climate activists, most notably the Sunrise Movement and the architect of the Green New Deal, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, upon um, getting elected, Joe Biden pledged a quote, whole of government approach to the climate crisis and proposed to slash emissions by 50% uh, by 2030 and decarbonize oh, electricity by 2035. Okay. Everything okay? Uh, yet here it is in 2022, it's clear things have gone horribly awry. Boom times have returned to the fossil fuel industry. By early 2022, oil and gas firms were reporting some of their best profits in nearly a decade. Um, and it wasn't just oil and gas, coal, the dirtiest of fossil fuels has also seen its prices and profits surge. This is the Financial Times reporting in March that a global surge in demand has delivered windfall profits for companies such as Glencore, Whitehaven Coal, and Peabody Energy. Peabody Energy reported a higher, much higher than expected profits this year. Uh, meanwhile, the Biden administration has really pulled back from their more ambitious climate goals, and the administration consistently says that the climate crisis is one that we can only just hope the private sector and the market will solve. Now, the, he recently passed the Inflation Reduction Act, but this sort of doubles down on that proposition that we'll just put out some, some tax credits and incentives and hope that consumers and investors will make the right choices with regard to climate change. So we really have to ask ourselves, what can we make of this impasse between fossil fuel production really gone wild alongside political inaction and cascading climate disaster? So at its core, our problem can be boiled down to this. Those that profit from the production of fossil fuels will continue to do so unless society can force them to stop. And this is fundamentally a question of power. In the book, uh, which is called Climate Change is Class War, I argue that this power struggle is fundamentally a class issue, an issue of who owns and controls the means of production and to what end. And thus it will, will require a class struggle to solve. So in this talk, I'm gonna give an overview of my book structure, which is basically based in three parts. It focuses on three basic classes at the core of climate politics today. The capitalist class that's responsible for the crisis, the professional class 
that is really drives climate advocacy and policy discussions, political activity. And finally, the working class that has both the power and numbers as the majority of society and the strate strategic capacity to shape the energy transition we need through labor and union organizing in that very energy sector. The core argument I'm trying to make in this book is that to take on the entrenched power of the first of these classes, the capitalists who control our energy system, we really need a mass uh, coalition, a mass movement that appeals to the vast majority of society in the working class. Ultimately, I argue, I argue we need a much more popular and majoritarian democratic approach to climate politics. And the professional class form of climate politics is uniquely bad at this um, sort of more popular majoritarian approach. Now I wanna dive in to take a deeper dive into how to understand this idea of class and how it shapes our thinking of climate politics. The idea that climate change is a problem of class inequality has attracted wide attention as of late. In 2015, Oxfam released a report entitled Extreme Carbon Inequality that found that the top percent, top 10 percent of people in the world are responsible for 50 percent of emissions, while the bottom 50 percent are only responsible for a mere 10 percent of emissions. Famous economist Thomas Piketty found similar numbers. Um, just last year, there was a study that blamed wealthy lifestyles and what they call the polluter elite. Um, and their actions for the climate crisis. And in 2018, a widely cited study found that it could compare different lifestyle actions that one can take to limit their climate impact and found one choice was more powerful than all the others, which is not having children. Um, now I wanna be clear, I'm kind of <laughs> critical of this particular way of thinking about climate change and inequality because all of these studies share two fundamental assumptions. First, they assume that class inequality is based on one's wealth, just purely on their wealth income, and above all their consumption or lifestyle practices. And second, and more perniciously, they link emissions and thus carbon responsibility to these same consumption and lifestyle practices. This linkage is based on a method of kind of carbon footprint accounting a metric that allows anyone to kind of input their consumption practices, the car they drive, the meat they eat, the children that they might rear. You can put all, all that into a calculator and then it can precisely determine how many pounds of carbon you emit per year. So this linking of emissions purely to consumption-based footprints is so entrenched, it's rarely ever questioned in mainstream discourse, even left or socialist discourse, uh, basically argues that climate change is a class problem because of the rich's consumption practices. But what I want to suggest today is this vision of class is very impoverished. By, re by placing responsibility for emissions solely on consumption, it actually accepts this quite um, problematic theory of consumer sovereignty, which is rooted in neoclassical economics and neoliberal ideology, which is a theory that really it's just dispersed consumers who have all the power in our economy and that the power is not in the hands of concentrated, the concentrated hands of corporations who control the production of energy in our economy. So what I wanna to suggest tonight is that there are ways of thinking about class that don't focus primarily on your income or your consumption or your lifestyle choices, and, and that is a more traditional socialist understanding of class, which centers not on consumption at all, but on production. Class is defined by your relationship to the means of production. And that probably sounds old fashioned to some extent, but I would argue the climate struggle is ultimately a struggle over this. It's about industrial production. It's about not only how we produce energy, but industrial producers are also the most significant source of emissions. One estimate suggests that just steel and cement production alone are responsible for about 15 to 20 percent of global carbon emissions. The Intergovernmental inter Panel on Climate Change also reports that the industrial sector alone is really a leading source of emissions at about 34 percent of the total. I'd also direct you to that AF 
A-G-R-O-U-L, which is agri agriculture, forestry, other land use. That is also a lot of productive activities like farming and forestry um, and other types of production. Production is shaped by a fundamentally different logic than consumption under capitalism. Ownership of capital for profit, investing money with the hope of making more is what is the logic that guides production in capitalism while consumption that we all partake in is very different. We use money to kind of sustain our needs, to reproduce our lives, to, to acquire the means of life itself. However extravagant that consumption might be, it's not guided by this sort of capitalist profit motive that production is. So when we shift our class analytic to this part of the world, production, ownership, and profit uh, uh, orientation, we can come to strikingly different conclusions about carbon and climate responsibility. First, we could point out that the entire idea of a carbon footprint was itself concocted by the very industry profiting off fossil fuels in the first place. A recent study asserts that the very notion of a carbon personal carbon footprint was first popularized by the, the firm British Petroleum in 2004. And they're very happy to direct all attention and responsibility for climate change away from them and towards all of us. And, and these ideas that we all have individual carbon footprints and so forth. Second, we should understand that every carbon footprint or individual moment of emissions or consumption is not isolated. It's actually a product of a web of social relations wrapped up in the production of that thing that's leading to emissions. So when you drive a car and you emit carbon out of your tailpipe, the gasoline in your tank flowed through the hands of innumerable people seeking profit off that exchange of your gasoline for your car. Oil exploration companies, consultants, rig service firms, pipeline companies, gas station operators. Yet carbon footprint methodology would assume that you should be 100% responsible for those emissions simply because you're at the end of that chain. Third, when we only focus on an individual's rich lifestyle in their consumption, we ignore how they became rich in the first place. And as it happens, that activity, how they generate their money and not how they spend it, could have much more significant climate impacts. So you can, oops, you can take a CEO of a chemical company. This person could spend eight to 12 hours per day helping organize a global network of chemical factories that emit millions of tons of carbon dioxide per year. As CEO, their income and their stock options are primarily derived from this activity, act, planning and expanding chemical, chemical production as a commodity for sale. Now, we can imagine this guy goes home in an SUV and eats a steak for dinner. Now, why is that activity, the steak and the SUV, the only activity we focus on when we talk about carbon inequality? Surely, the SUV and steak are just tiny drops in the bucket compared to this person's everyday roles, this kind of titan of chemical capital. But here again, what I'm arguing is the main culprits for climate crisis are not just affluent consumers, but rather it's a, a smaller class of people who profit from the production of aviation, of automobiles, of steel, of chemicals, and other carbon intensive forms of capital. You know, if, if, Brad, if Brad Pitt or a Hollywood actor drove a Hummer, but a fossil fuel executive took public transit, we wouldn't say that, um, you know, the, the Brad Pitt is more responsible because he has a higher carbon footprint than the fossil fuel executive. Yet carbon footprint accounting would say the Hollywood actor has more responsibility than the fossil fuel executive because you only look at someone's consumption. I actually think this analysis really clarifies our political task. Instead of a moral project to convert the lifestyles of billions of dispersed consumers, we face a perhaps harder, but also more straightforward political project to erode the power of a small class of people who control and profit from the production of carbon intensive uh, uh, systems. So that is the first part of the book that focuses on 
the capitalist class and, it, and its ownership and profit orientation towards production as being the ultimate culprit. The second part of the book focuses on who really drives climate politics in our world today. And I argue that is what I call the professional class. This class is made up of credential degree holders, like journalists, like scientists, like academics, like myself, like uh, people that work at non-governmental organizations like NGOs. These are the people that are at the core of climate advocacy. And this, by the way, this class also happens to be the class most invested in this kind of moral politics about making the right lifestyle choices and lowering your carbon footprint and all this kind of stuff. I should say that I proposed this book in 2017. And since then, there has been a massive debate on the left and particularly in, within Democratic Socialists of America and the socialist left uh, uh, along this sort of idea of a professional managerial class. And, and um, I wanna be clear that there's really no inherent problem with professional class people doing environmental politics or doing left politics or any kind of politics, all left-wing and socialist movements and all successful social movements have always had these kinds of layers of inner intellectuals and professional revolutionaries and so forth. But if professional class politics is actively antagonistic to the masses of working people, that can be a problem. And that's the problem I wanna identify um, today and what I identify in the book. So who is the professional class? What is the professional class? I'll make three crucial points. First, the material project of the professional class is about marshalling credentials, things like degrees or licenses or other forms of accreditation to carve out advantages in the labor market. The focus on educational attainment means the professional class is also ideologically attached to ideas of meritocracy and that one's own material position is somehow dependent on their knowledge and their smarts. Materially, this means the professional class project is ultimately one aimed towards achieving a kind of middle class level of economic security. Second, and perhaps most crucially, the professional class, at least in the United States, is a relative small percentage of society as a whole. Kim Moody estimates that um, only about 22% of the workforce in the United States um, can be associated with the professional class. Around 63% of Americans, adult Americans, lack a bachelor's degree. So you can immediately conclude that we're not talking about a majoritarian mass popular basis for a political movement in the professional class. Third, thinking about our definition of class as based on your relationship to production and ownership, the professional class is profoundly With, um, shrimp. separated from... Uh, can I just get the substance? Anyone gonna mute George? George, can you mute yourself? Um, profoundly separated from material production and largely confined to what is called the, the kind of knowledge economy. So the rise of the professional class actually paralleled the decline of the industrial working class and across the 20th century, particularly. So consequently, the professional class tends to view industrial production more as a source of harm and environmental destruction and not as a system that in traditional socialist politics, the working class has to seize and control and, and repurpose towards social and ecological needs. Yet that is actually what I would argue that the climate crisis and solving the climate crisis really is more about, it's more about seizing control over the industrial system and transforming it to deal with this climate problem. So on this basis, we can identify two basic approaches to shaping professional class climate politics. First, it is deeply invested in the politics of knowledge a politics of belief or denial in the science of climate change. You can think of the March for Science during the Trump years as a kind of mass action of the professional class and this kind of outrage and focus on post-truth and the war on facts and all this kind of stuff. The second point, because of the professional class's relative material comfort, comfort and separation from production, 
Professional class environmental politics is often rooted in a kind of anxiety around their own consumption or what in chapter four of the book I describe as carbon guilt. At the core of the professional class politics is a contradiction. It's based on using credentials to attain economic security, but the forms of consumption attached to that security, like single family homes or car ownership or professional expectations of flight travel, create tremendous feelings of ecological complicity while the world burns. This leads to the idea that they themselves are the core drivers of climate change and not the owners of capital as detailed in the previous section. Rather than focus on the ones with the real power over society and our energy system, professionals blame themselves. So in this book, I categorize three core professional class types that have driven climate politics for the last several decades. So I'm gonna explain how each of these types also espouses a climate politics that's again, inherently kind of antagonistic towards the majority of working class people in our very unequal and often barbaric form of capitalism in the United States. So the first type is what I call science communicators who are either natural scientists who's like, expertise is based on um, you know spreading the the truth of climate climate change or they're sort of otherwise deeply invested in knowing what the science says like environmental journalists so this type of person tends to believe that the primary problem in environmental politics is like the lack of awareness or the den outright denial of the scientific knowledge and, and if the masses really believed and truly understood the science that action would inevitably follow. It should be obvious that this kind of knowledge politics is not really speaking to the direct material concerns of the masses of working people. Now, I don't want to imply that working class people don't understand climate science. I'm sure many do, but it still does not represent a politics that can really have immediate material appeal, appeal to people that are struggling to pay for rent or um, get their kids to in a decent childcare and this kind of thing. The second type of professional class environmental politics is what I call the policy technocrat, whose expertise is more likely to be based in law or policy studies. They might work in think tanks, academia, or professionalized NGOs. These types of uh, people try to design kind of smart policy solutions and use logic and rational policy design to sway politicians and the public towards these solutions. For the last few decades, these technocrats have even been convinced that they can um, design free market policies like carbon pricing um, or carbon taxes or what this organization uh, calls for a carbon fee and dividend. Um, and th these policies really think we can channel the market and the profit motive to allow the private sector to just smoothly solve all our environmental problems. These types of policy technocrats even subscribe to the, I would argue, delusional idea that these solutions can be bipartisan and that they can attract Republican support for their free market ideas, despite everything that the GOP continues to stand for. Um, so a main organization uh, advocating for this approach even has a slogan that we're gonna outsmart climate change. And this is kind of at the core of the professional class that it's all about being smart and being educated and that you can come up with really, really smart policy designs that can um, essentially logically solve the crisis through uh, complicated technocratic legislation. And we see how the masses of working people respond to these kinds of smart market-based policies. Carbon tax referendums failed in Washington State, oops, Washington State in 2016 and 2018. And as the Yellow Vest movement, the Gilets Jaunes movement in France, they responded to a carbon tax put down by Macron in France with the slogan, politicians are concerned with the end of the world, we are concerned with the end of the month. So these types of policies are not particularly popular. Consequently, workers are increasingly receptive to the right-wing view that environmental policy will harm their economic lives. 
If anyone mobilizes class politics in the climate fight, it's actually the right who consistently cites the economic consequences of climate policy in the form that it's going to cost jobs or economic competitiveness or um, lead to uh, less economic security for all. Here is arch climate villain Charles Koch of the oil-based Koch Industries, where he frames himself a friend of the working class because he's concerned about climate policy raising the cost of energy for poor people. Finally, there's the third type of professional class climate activists is what I call the anti-system radicals, whose own exposure to the science of ecological collapse leads to a kind of political radicalization. And again, their professional class location creates a context of kind of relative material comfort and economic security. So they tend to focus most of their attention on the need to lessen consumption and overall leads to a kind of what I call a politics of less. I'm not sure if your organization, it's very popular in acad academia, but not sure if you're aware that the most popular form of this politics is epitomized by what is called the degrowth movement, which in one CNBC profile puts it that we really need to learn to live better with less. And they focus a lot on this aggregate focus that we need to reduce uh, throughput and energy consumption at the aggregate. But what I would argue this aggregate focus on less really evades a kind of class struggle approach that I would advocate. Rather than just saying we need to degrow in general, the class approach would advocate degrowing the capitalist class, taxing the rich, if you will, so that we can actually grow a lot of things that we need like green energy, like more public transit, and most importantly, working class people need to see growth in their ability to access and secure the very basics of life like food and housing and healthcare. And degrowthers support many of these ideas, but they always center and highlight the need for less overall and planned reduction as sort of at the core of their program. So I think it's worth mentioning that none of these movements are succeeding in solving the climate crisis we face. So we need to, a massive shift in strategy if we're gonna be able to build a movement with the power to take on some of the most powerful, uh, powerful uh, corporations in world history. So this is where the third angle comes in, the working class. Again, this is largely a democratic argument and it's not just an electoral argument about, uh, you know, this, again, this, I really recommend this book called The Working Class Majority, which sort of crunches the numbers of all the various types of occupations in the United States and finds that even if you take out the professionals and the managers, you're really talking about 63% of the workforce is um, uh, in kind of very low wage very precarious, very uh, often very manual forms of labor as opposed to mental or knowledge forms of labor. Okay. Um, so, and it's not just an electoral argument that this is the majority of society that can get the right politicians elected, but it's also just if you look in history that more powerful social movements have always been able to, to, to kind of deliver what this little socialist pamphlet calls mass action or mass uh, popular uh, politics that really resonates with wider society and is able to create a huge amount of energy and and around a set of popular demands that forces elites to answer to these demands. So the first step toward a kind of working class climate politics is is finding a way to counter this right-wing narrative that climate action is not in the interest of the working class. So if the working class has kind of basic material interests, can we say that those are connected to solving climate change? Is there any connection at all between what workers' basic material needs are and the planet of uh, the planetary crisis of climate change? Answering this, I think, requires going back to a basic kind of socialist definition of the working class or what Karl Marx called the proletariat as a class that's fundamentally separated from the means of production and really a class that was only formed once it was actually expelled from the land or dispossessed from the land 
or any secure means of subsistence. We can see that once the, the mat, you know, this only happened over the course of maybe 500 years, but as the more and more people are torn from the land, they're torn from the very basic uh, secure access to subsistence and survival. So what defines the working class under capitalism is this fundamental proletarian insecurity in accessing the basic means of life itself. And this is, I argue in the book, like really ecological. You know, we are living ecological beings and the fact that capitalism withholds our basic needs from us really is an ecological problem. In fact, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, herself, when asked to define what democratic socialism means to her, she just said, in a very wealthy, the wealthiest country in history, no one should be too poor to live. Yet in the United States, in the richest country on earth, there are a tremendous economic deprivation that happens on a huge bulk of the population. Something like 64% of our country lives paycheck to paycheck. All these stats I'm going to say are really exacerbated by the inflation crisis that we're experiencing right now. Huge proportions of uh, struggle to afford basic things like one, one fifth struggle to afford food, about one third struggle to afford utility bills, which is at the core of the climate crisis, 50% struggle to afford housing, two thirds struggle to afford health care in our particularly barbaric country. It should be clear that the working class has a material interest to secure better and more basic access to these needs of life. It is convenient that these very basic working class needs, housing, energy, transportation, and food, these are the same things and sectors that we need to aggressively decarbonize uh, or uh, uh, basically transform towards low carbon sources of energy if we wanna solve climate change. So if we could pair decarbonization with cheaper or free or what socialists call decommodified access to these basic needs, that could be a way to construct a more working class climate program. Note that this kind of interest in climate action would have nothing to do with living better with less or material sacrifice or knowledge of the science or belief in the science. It simply would seek to appeal to people's everyday material needs that they struggle to secure. And it has much broader base for mass appeal because everyone knows how stressful and exhausting it is to try to meet your basic needs under our capitalist system. So this is actually what the Green New Deal proposed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the US, but also Jeremy Corbyn's Labor Party. This is what they were attempting to construct with this type of working class climate program. But this uh, Green New Deal, of course, draws on a history, a New Deal a history of really massive public investment that was actually about delivering material gains for working class people. Um, so, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority that was built under um, FDR during the New Deal really had a slogan of electricity for all. And it was, you know, the Rural Electrification Administration that was really about just building out huge amounts of electricity to rural areas that didn't have it. The New Deal hired Woody Guthrie to sing folk songs about the New Deal and about uh, hydroelectric dams and rivers doing work for the people. There's this kind of very positive and populist vision of mass investment delivering mass benefits to masses of people. Now, the problem, of course, is the theory of change of a Green New Deal is that you actually have to deliver these material gains like the original one did to the working class for them to actually believe that climate action means real improvement in their lives. The fundamental challenge with much insurgent left politics, including Bernie Sanders's couple presidential campaigns, is that the working class might agree with your program, but the main barrier to winning their support is that they do not believe that such a progressive platform like free healthcare for all or the Green New Deal, they don't believe that these things are possible to pull off. As Vivek Chibber has recently argued, workers are more prone to what we could call apathy or resignation, that things are really bad, but there's really nothing we can do to change them. 
And in many ways, the Green New Deal and the Bernie Sanders movement put the cart before the horse. They thought a political program could awaken the kind of sleeping giant of the working class from decades of atomization and demobilization and political defeat. But history, like the 1930s, shows it's typically working class organization that comes first in the form of trade unions or political parties. And it's only these organized forms of power that can actually start to deliver material benefits and gains and thus build confidence amongst the working class masses that they deserve better and they can win better through collective action. And it's only this that can convince them that to be part of a kind of broader political movement. So this brings us to the other key question about a working class strategy for climate, which is what should the role of unions be or the labor movement be? How can workers use their strategic power in the workplace at the point of production to you know, strike and shut things down and, and really create a crisis and cut off capital's profits at the source? In the environmental movement, there is much consternation on the negative role of uh, labor unions and the labor movement in resisting the decarbonization agenda. The unions tend to prioritize good union jobs no matter what the ecological consequences. But it's not as if neoliberal austerity offers much of a safety net to these workers. And when coal mines and power plants are shut down, all they see is mass unemployment and economic deprivation. Again, it's this proletarian insecurity that causes workers and unions to choose jobs over the environment every time. Now, the standard left response to this dilemma is say that we're going to create something called a just, transi uh, just transition. And this is an idea that uh, displaced workers in the fossil fuel industry or, or dirty industries should be given support as they transition into the clean energy economy or or other sectors that are better for the planet. Hold on a sec. The problem is that much of the fossil fuel workforce has really never heard of the just transition and the communities hollowed out by a coal mine or a power plant closure certainly don't believe there's anything on offer called a just transition because again, all they see is unemployment and economic devastation, not to mention opioid abuse and deaths of despair and all the sort of horrors that we've seen in these kind of hollowed out deindustrialized communities across uh, the United States. So we should not forget that the whole idea of a just transition came from this legendary union leader and environmentalist named Tony Mazaki. It's often forgotten Mazaki modeled his idea on a policy, he modeled his idea for a just transition on a policy that was enacted in kind of the last hurrah of the New Deal, which is the GI Bill. Over nearly three decades, the GI Bill helped more than 13 million former soldiers find civilian employment transition to, from a war economy to a civilian economy and pursue other kinds of educational opportunities. Rather than kind of sloganeering around a just, just transition, a real just transition would need this kind of mass public sector uh, welfare state expansion effort to actually convince these fossil fuel workers that, that there is actually something for them if we were to rapidly phase out the fossil fuel industry. Just transition politics also has a really limited vision of what working class power can achieve. It actually imagines workers as victims that need to be helped and transitioned into a new economy. And of course, this is true. We do need to transition like coal workers in a, in a climate stable world, but a real working class strategy for climate change would actually position workers and unions as actually not victims, but powerful agents of transformation. So a union-based climate strategy should actually think about how can we organize the labor movement and unions to be fighters for a climate transition. And to do that, you really need to recognize that it's strategic to kind of focus your organizing on specific sectors of the economy. Uh, labor organizer Jane McAlevey recounts how in the 1930s, the, 30s, the famous Congress of Industrial Organizations, they really decided to focus on specific sectors 
to build their power in that were strategic to build their power in like steel and coal and automobiles. And they were able to build power in those sectors and, and, and that power translated into strikes that actually fundamentally shut society down when they took place. Today, she proposes that we focus on healthcare workers, education workers, and logistic workers. We've been hearing a lot about a possible rail strike. The, the potential for logistics workers to really shut down the flow of goods in society more largely really gives those workers tremendous objective power over, um, over you know, if they decide to strike or withhold their labor, they can really force politicians like Joe Biden to kind of answer to a set of demands. Okay, so for climate, we need to think about what would be a strategic sector for workers to organize in. So it's clear that any rational pathway to 100% decarbonization or zero carbon economy goes through actually one sector, it's the electric utility sector. So you may have heard of there's this electrify everything strategy, which means we need to clean up the electricity sector and make it all zero carbon based electricity and then electrify all the things that don't currently run on electricity like residential heating. You can switch to heat pumps like transportation. You can switch to um, battery powered vehicles, uh, EVs or more better, you can switch to uh, electrify public transit. Um, uh, and we need to sort of figure out how to deal with a lot of harder to, de to decarbonize uh, industries like industrial heat processes, aviation, and, and electricity has limited application in those. But if you can just clean up electricity, electrify a whole lot of stuff, you're doing about 80 to 90% of the stuff we need to do to really decarbonize. Yet few Green, Green New Deal activists have really pointed out that the electric utility sector is already one of the most unionized in the entire economy, about 25% union membership in 2020. So this could be our strategic sector to organize in for climate movement and the labor movement. These workers are represented by unions like the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and the Utility Workers Union of America. So if the climate movement wants to get serious, it really should try to win these unions to their side in order to transform the very sector that these workers are in, and that's at the core of any solution that we're going to construct. We also should point out that renewable energy industries like solar and wind are notoriously non-union, actually, and they're run almost entirely for profit by private capital. They're owned by Wall Street, and climate activists really should make an argument that, that these unions in the electric sector really should mount a long-term strategy to ensure that the energy transition is controlled by the unions and them. And otherwise, if they don't really fight and if they don't have a strategy, they're gonna be swept away or destroyed by this kind of renewable form of green capitalism. So in conclusion, um, it's eight o'clock, so. In conclusion, there's one last motto of traditional working class politics that we should talk about, which is internationalism, socialist internationalism. The famous socialist anthem, the Internationale, claimed that it wanted to unite the human race. Now, in the face of the prospect of human extinction and planetary ruin, we need a new kind of sort of ecological internationalism that's not only about emancipating and uniting the, the, the masses of humanity, but saving humanity from this planetary ruin. Now, ecological politics often really points toward reuniting local communities with local ecologies or returning to the land and localizing farm systems. But on the other hand, a proletarian ecological internationalism would have to be planetary in scope. And again, Marx and others and socialists believe that it was the working class that was torn from the land and torn from any kind of direct local or parochial concerns that made the, wor the working class under capitalism and the proletariat this kind of universal class, a class that could indeed unite and emancipate humanity as a whole. And I do think we really should assert a wider human interest in the very core of the climate crisis, which is energy. In particular, we need to recognize 
a fundamental point which organizer uh, organizers are already calling for that electricity in all its benefits that we're all participating in here on zoom it should be a human right there are currently around seven to eight hundred million people on planet earth that have no electricity access whatsoever um the but the amount of people on this planet that have very limited electricity access is even more staggering the energy analyst robert bryce recently did some calculations to reveal that his his and probably mine and yours refrigerator only consumes about a thousand kilowatts per year, which is more than the annual consumption of about 3.3 billion people on Earth. So that's about 45% of the planet right there that consumes less per year than your refrigerator. So there can be a mass politics of delivering electricity to these masses of impoverished people while decarbonizing that electric system and solving climate change at the same time. Now, I'm not sure how popular this will be for this particular audience, but that actually this idea of delivering electricity to the masses harkens back to the famous revolutionary leader of the socialist movement, Vladimir Lenin, whose revolutionary movement took place in a, in a rural, somewhat backward country of Russia, where many lacked sort of basic material amenities. And he famously argued that for the revolution to work, you needed this thing he called communism is Soviet or worker power plus the electrification of the whole country. So for Lenin, at least, the socialist project was fundamentally about extending the benefits of modern electricity to the masses of peasants and poor uh, deprived masses in Russia. And they actually followed up on this. They did electrify huge parts of Russia very rapidly in the 20s and 30s. So I would propose we should resurrect this kind of vision for working class emancipation and hu human uh, saving, uh, survival through energy systems to stave off climate disaster. And I will end right there and look forward to your comments or questions. Thank you. Sorry about that. Nature was calling for a little bit. So now we're into our question time. And uh, who's got uh, first questions? Matt, I got a question for you first. There's a gentleman out there who talks about human flourishing and that there's a we have a moral obligation to use fossil fuels to to uh, support human flourishing versus, uh, um, you know, re instead of regarding all of our usage of fossil fuels is a bad is a bad thing that we should be using it as a good thing because we have had humans flourishing for the last 300 years and that until we can get a replacement in for the large amount of power that we should continue to use fossil fuels can you comment please yeah i don't know if you're talking about alex epstein that's exactly who i'm referring to as alex epstein uh epstein um so in, in some ways, I agree with him. Um, I'm actually an energy scholar, an energy historian. And one thing through studying the history of energy I discovered pretty quickly is just how incredible fossil fuels <laughs> were in yeah. terms of lifting up humanity from all these constraints that humanity faced. The biggest one is before fossil fuels, about 85% of energy for work, which is you often hear energy is the capacity to do work, well, 85% of energy had to be accomplished by muscle power, by human or animal muscle power. And, and that created a society that just was fundamentally exploitative. And, and, and obviously it included things like slavery and all sorts of just brutal, coercive, violent forms of, of exploiting the, 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 the real muscular labor of humans and other animals to just get the basic work done to reproduce society. Fossil fuels, not just fossil fuels, but particularly the industrial revolution of automatic machinery and machines allowed us to break free from that kind of labor constraint. The other massive thing we need to think about is um, before fossil fuels, if we wanted to use energy, we needed to devote a lot of land to that energy use. So particularly, say you wanted to smelt iron down for an iron industry. Well, to do that, you needed 
forest of, of fuel. You needed wood to create charcoal, which was the fuel of choice for those types of industries. And, and so um, in any kind of heat process industry from, from uh, glass making to beer making needed a whole lot of wood. Needed, and so acres and acres of land. And, and also not to mention all that labor for mussels, you needed land to grow food for those animals. Do you know in the, in the 1800s, uh, about a quarter of American agriculture was just devoted to growing feed for working animals. <laughs> so acres and acres of land devoted to fueling the energy system. Fossil fuels, you dig deep under the earth and you need much less land and you get this extremely dense energy source. So that being said, um, the problem with fossil fuels is it's like concentrated sunlight. It's like millions of years of solar energy concentrated in this stuff. And when you burn it, it creates tremendous amounts of, of, of waste and carbon dioxide that goes in the atmosphere. And that's heating up the planet right now. And it's creating a very unstable situation for our civilization. Cause we've been, basically our civilization came to being in a very stable climate during the Holocene period. So my reading of Alex Epstein is he doesn't seem to think the climate crisis is that big of a problem. <laughs> And he, he, he emphasizes the, the incredibly liberatory aspects of fossil fuels, but then he doesn't, he doesn't seem to really acknowledge that we have to get off fossil fuels if we want to maintain conditions for, of a habitable planet for everyone. So um, I agree, we need to sort of recognize the benefits of fossil fuels, but we also need to figure out a way to replicate those benefits with different forms of non-fossil based energy. Should I call on people? I, I, I see hands. I'm saying as a corollary, uh, what do you think about the uh, molten salt reactor, the, the thorium molten salt reactor, if you've ever heard about it? And then we'll get into other people. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know much about the thorium salt molten <laughs> reactor, okay, but okay. I will say, I will say I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of nuclear energy simply, um, because it does have similar benefits, uh, particularly in land use aspects that fossil fuels prevent and it can provide reliable 24 seven power. And I think, and it's not just me, I mean, the, the IPCC and other scientific models that say like, how are we gonna get off fossil fuels? They all agree that there's gotta be some role for nuclear power as the, when once you build these things, it's basically zero carbon energy. So I do think that has to be a huge part of the equation. All right, Dan and Lana, you're up next. Go ahead and answer your, ask your question. Okay, uh, my question is about the radical people you said, not professional, but there's groups like Science Rebellion and mm -hmm. XR Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. And um, I'm just thinking, are those do you you didn't consider those groups right they don't plan to change the system they glue themselves to more uh chase bank yep they lay down in the street yep. what do you think of that well you you call them radical not professional but i would I would suggest if you do some research on those groups and, and try to see who are the people that are part of those groups, you're going to find that most of them are probably um, in this kind of professional class. Most of them probably have college education. Most of them probably um, are, are, are sort of, again, sort of in the knowledge economy, if you will. But that doesn't mean they aren't, they can't be radical, right? What I, what I, I, you know, I, painting with a very broad brush, I have found that sometimes XR, um, Extinction Rebellion, engages in these direct actions that um, are not really thinking about how can we translate direct action into mass popular politics, which I think you, you can look back to the civil rights movement and you can see how the sit-ins, 
the sit-ins and the other, the boycott of the buses and, and these kinds of direct actions really led to a kind of, um, you know, mass appeal and mass empathy with the civil rights movement that really created um, huge popular support for them. I would actually say that the Standing Rock occupation in 2016 was that kind of mass politics because it really created this bubbling up of huge popular support and energy for for these indigenous resistance fighters and all the activists that were involved. Now, XR often engages in types of actions that lead to popular mm -hmm. backlash, right? Um, they mm -hmm. famously uh, basically uh, had a direct action on a commuter train in London, I think, that that disrupted the commutes of many working class people and led to all this anger and people yelling at them. And, 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 and a lot of their other direct actions have not really translated into this kind of mass popular empathy and support. Uh, maybe they could figure out a way to do that, but right now I don't, I don't see that. I don't know a ton about science rebellion, but just the fact that it's, I, if I know, if I, I'm pretty sure it's scientists, right, who are part of that group, and that is, again, that's one of the core categories of the professional class that I'm talking about. So whenever you see kind of um, climate activism in general, it's going to be these types of people, journalists, scientists, Ac uh, academically credentialed people. And, and my argument is that these people tend to think like each other. They, they, they live in these kind of cultural bubbles. They all speak the same language and they don't necessarily know how to reach a wider mass popular base, uh, which is what we need to, to actually build the power to take on the fossil fuel industry. All right, Jacob, we're going to have to kind of shorten our answers a little bit because we've got a number of people with questions. Jacob, yes, from, sorry. that's all right. Jacob from NYC, unmute and ask your question. <clears throat> yeah, I created a uh, group on Facebook. It's called, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, called Creating a Wonderful World. And there I list all the solutions, uh, as many as I can find over the past 10 years, all very wonderful, creative, practical solutions to many of our problems facing mankind. The, but the major problem, and this is what I wanna hear from Matt, is what is your proposal to actually implement these solutions, not just on a small scale, but on a grand scale? Yep. I wanna know your strategy. I wanna know your plan of action, right? I've developed it and I have one in uh, creating a wonderful world group. But I'd like to hear others. What is your strategy? What is your plan of action? And what are you doing about it to actually be in a position to implement the solutions? Oh, okay. Um, it's, Otherwise, it's just talking, you know. Yeah. So ultimately, I was very optimistic and hopeful and organizing strongly um, among this kind of movement that was personified by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Green New Deal. But the basic idea is that what we need is a massive like World War II level mobilization of investment, right? That's what we need to solve climate change. We need a big bunch of investment in building a whole new energy system, but also building uh, new uh, you know, retrofitted green housing. We need new public transit. We need so, and, and we need massive new transmission lines and all the rest of it. And to, to be honest, I think the, the original New Deal gives a, us a lot of hope that at least historically, we were able to do that kind. I mean, that's what the New Deal was. It was a massive public investment program. They didn't just build big energy systems and transmission lines, but they built schools, they built libraries, they built music amphitheaters, they built, it, it was just an incredible um state-led public uh oriented investment program um and so that is and and actually you can look at um some countries around the world that actually during the energy crisis in the 1970s france and sweden decided to because of the insecurity of oil and fossil fuels they decided to just massively build out nuclear power and they rapidly decarbonize their electricity sector in about 10 years. So those are examples of, 
and and I think the key is the power of the, the state is really there, there's no avoiding the state in this kind of strategy because we have so little time to solve climate change and and we need it the only thing that really has the power and fiscal capacity to do that kind of mass investment program is the state so um the problem you know this kind of movement really was attached to kind of Bernie Sanders in the 2020 cycle and that lost so now we're kind of trying to trying to recalibrate about what can we do um, in the interim and in hope that maybe in the next decade or so political conditions might change where that kind of opportunity for a more kind of left-wing redistribute, redistributist sort of politics that focuses on taxing the rich to, to invest in a massive um, public sector-led investment program would be on the table. It's not really on the table right now, I will acknowledge that. But um, my, I'm not good at short answers. The other part of the strategy is, of course, building up the power of the labor movement, which is what my talk tried to talk about, building worker power in the electricity sector is a more focused kind of labor organizing strategy that we can do today and do right now. And um, I know people in Democratic Socialists of America are doing that very thing. They're getting jobs in uh, the electric industry. They're getting jobs in the unions like the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So this is this is a more concrete. And I actually think any unions can be powerful in, in, in calling for transformative change. So a lot of people are getting jobs as teachers or nurses to try to build a much more militant working class movement in the unions and in the labor movement. That I think is the most powerful thing we can do today. Okay, Charlie, you're next. Yes, Matthew, uh, I'm of communist persuasion and a party member. And I'm often told uh, that ca communism failed and capitalism works. <laughs> capitalism works. I was wondering, how would you respond to their assertion that capitalism works? Uh, well, it's, it's funny because Capitalism, you know, it, that's a tough one. Well, looking at the figures of 63%. Yeah. Don't have a, a standard of living. Yes. And I was also surprised, I'll be honest with you, if I may get, get lengthier, that it looks like Bangladesh or the places in Asia with sweatshops are locations where the people do not have electricity. I, I believe that was on the map. So that even people are employed in these uh, oh increasing standard of living sweatshops, better to have a job than no job, still do not have electricity at home. Yeah. So that's a good argument for why capitalism does not work. I mean, we've had the technology of electricity for over a hundred years now, and 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 we haven't been able to just give. The mass of humanity that that benefit we also you know there's about the same amount of people struggle to have enough food to eat there's a lot of people that struggle with hunger in the richest country on the earth so the fact that's kind of the the, the indictment of capitalism is it it's really good at producing all this wealth and production but it 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 enforces this level of scarcity on the mass of the population where um, so many people go without amidst this abundance that is so clearly there and so clearly could be extended to everyone, but yet we don't. And that, that's really the indictment. And there's been lots of mass death in the last 200 years that somehow evades capitalism's culpability. But many people have, have pointed out, um, you know, the British Empire you know, um, witnessed massive famines in India and other parts of the, and, and, and engaged in atrocities in Africa and other parts of the world. And those millions of dead, um, they just don't get added up and calculated as a, as a, as, as you know, this is capitalism death toll, like the way in which communism gets those numbers counted for them. So okay. it's a dicey, dicey, dicey debate though, so. Okay, let's move on. Rosalie, I got a question. Please unmute and I ask it. Unmute, Mar Rosalie. Rosalie, we can't hear you. Can you unmute, please? 
Rosalie, we can't hear you. You got to unmute. The main question I have is that you have not mentioned the military at all and the US military with its bases all over the world and its tremendous expenditures, which impoverish people in America because of that um, capitalist expenditures. Um, so that's my first question. And my second question is, how can we begin to mobilize people when um, everybody's so connected electronically and we basically listen to people that agree with us? Mm -hmm. And um, I've written two books on nonviolent civil disobedience, which did great things in the civil rights movement and great things in the Vietnam War. And we need to have massive, massive civil disobedience and massive getting together of everybody, working class, professional class, um, because if we don't, we're doomed. Mm -hmm. So two things how to mobilize people and what to do about the military expenditures, which are one of the, the military in the US is the biggest polluter in the world. Yeah. Um, so the military is kind of, it's kind of akin to the fossil fuel industry. Um, and there's a lot of connections between the two. And, and it just, it shows that we're really up against these incredibly powerful institutions that and court let's just corporations that oh. have entrenched power over our state apparatus and and wield all sorts of of um power over policy making and and so um you know it's easy to sort of be like it's hopeless we'll never can we'll never be able to overcome such tremendous power um but the only thing that gives me hope is you can look in history <laughs> and there have been, and you were just talking about, there have been examples of entrenched power structures who benefit from the exploitation of, of a majority of the public and, and their power was overcome. Um, you can look to the abolition movement where you had literally the, the plantation owners were 1% of US society and they derived all this wealth from slavery and all this profit and their power seemed insurmountable. And, you know, in 1820, the abolitionists seemed like a hopeless movement that could never, and, and, and decade after death, decade, they chipped away and they built, particularly they built what I was referring to as a kind of mass politics through, if you can believe it, the Republican party at the time, which emerged as this third party and kind of had this very populist mass politics about abolition, but also free free land and free labor for the masses of, of people. And they were able to win this power. And eventually, you, you know what they did is they 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 you know emancipated the slaves, but what that was in effect was the expropriation of the property of the planter class. And you know, the British abolitionists, they paid the slave owners compensation for taking their property. <laughs> But in the US, we didn't pay them any compensation at all. We just took, we just emancipated the slaves. Um, and then you look at the, the labor movement in the 1930s where basically workers went on strike all over the country, shut down Minneapolis, San Francisco. They basically created this militant uh, labor action that forced FDR to engage in a much more radical um, a uh, program that was based on massively taxing the rich, massively extending labor rights to the, the workers and the unions. And Wall Street was trying to overthrow FDR for this. There was a, a plot to, to coup FDR, if you can believe that. But, but he was able to, you know, evade that. And, and so anyway, there, that's what gives me hope is that history shows examples of tremendous power being overcome through mass movements. Um, the question of how to mobilize um, is that is a difficult one. Um, what I try to argue and what I was trying to argue is that we really need to connect climate change to people's everyday material struggles to get by in this economy 
and not make it about abstract scientific or planetary disaster type things, um, which tends to be the kind of narrative. So um, it's not easy, but it, but it also has to be, I think, connected to not just, can't just be a single climate issue. It should be connected to like the Green New Deal was trying to do, like um, connected to wider inequality in the economy and the kind of wider domination of corporations over not just climate, but healthcare and um, everything else, uh, the communications. And so it has to be a sort of like sort of broad based um, movement that confronts uh, corporate power as a whole, I'd say. But the internet right. and the fact that we don't hear the same issues has made that kind of organizing just a completely different thing. Rosalie, you know? we're gonna we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have a rebuttal period in a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to keep going okay. with questions, but I appreciate your commenting tonight and uh, thanks for the questions. All right, Corey, I know you've been kind of waving your hand in there. Unmute and uh, start uh, asking your question. Okay, my question is yes or no. So I'll make one comment. You are wrong. We did pay the slave owners for all the slaves that were taken away for those that were in the United States of America. It was only in the Confederate States where they did not get compensated. Right, yeah. Now, my, it, my question is yes or no. So please just answer yes or no and go on to the next question. Are you willing to have a nuclear plant built halfway between your home and your kid's grade school? If the answer <laughs> is no, then you're on the wrong side of the, cl of the class war. Yes or no, what is your answer? Yes, yes, I'd right. be fine with it. Me. Okay, Raj, you're next. Uh, I do not know what you are smoking or drinking, but uh, the we had a COVID. We lost million people. COVID, you know, the, the, the plague. We lost a million people. And uh, we were supposed to be the expert on management and manufacturing and innovations. And we couldn't do it. Yeah. We did the worst, worst in the world, okay? And you're talking about revolution. We're talking about political revolution. You are not interested in all these questions people are asking. You want power. And you say, yeah, you have power, you can do it. But that's what everybody says. You know, Biden says same thing, Trump says same thing. You know, Putin says same thing, okay? And we, and, uh, so we, have a, we, have, we have a massive block. We do not know how to manage we do not know how to deliver what we think we have capacity to deliver. We are not able to do that. You know, India is struggling for so many years. And Gandhi accomplished, there was unique accomplishment with a mass movement, Gandhiji. Okay, and he did that, but he did a just sliver of thing. And then, then came, he said he retired. But, but we, we do not have that capacity at all. And what 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 Elon Musk had, had done is extraordinary. What China has done to get millions of people out of poverty is extraordinary. Do you think do you think your project will better follow a China policy and will work, or who, whom you consider a leader in a present world that can do the job you are asking for, or who can be a leader in a world who can do it? And if you cannot do it. Then hey, give up. I mean, you are you are, you are just you have blowing a smoke. You are not doing anything else. Thank you. All right, go ahead and uh, Matt, and uh, let's go with your answer. Again, I think we forget that this country used to be able to do extraordinary, big, massive things very quickly. You know, I just learned this week. I didn't know this, but we built the Empire Empire State Building in one year took one year to build the Empire, Empire State Building. And in the New Deal, we please, basically- Please, please, I said, let me intervene, okay? Please, don't go yesterday. Okay, yesterday was a small country. You, Salt Lake City, I lived, population was 100,000. Utah population of 1 million. But now it's a bigger and it's complex. Don't it's go not, yesterday. No, you're, you're, talking, you're talking about tomorrow. Give me no. the future. In the, in the 1930s, we had a population of many, many millions, probably 150 million people. I don't know exactly, but it was a massive society. And we were able to basically, you know, 10% of farmers had electricity in 1934, 90 plus percent had it by 1950. It's an extraordinary, massive public investment in 
electrifying the countryside in about 15 years. That's scale of what we need to do to solve climate change. And the fact that we just don't believe we can do big things anymore is a big problem. Like you said, China's doing big things. They're they're able to build high speed rail. They're they're actually building about 150 nuclear plants that they have online. They're massively investing in solar and wind. And 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 so if if it's not some inherent problem with us that we simply can't do big things. It's something that's happened in our politics where we've been we've we've sort of bought into this, you know, austerity mindset that, you know, oh, no, that, 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 excuse me, I'm sorry, but complexity, we have tremendous complexity, we are not able to do things. And complexity wasn't there when Hoover Dam was built. Complexity think... was not not there when GM created a big company. Okay. Now complexity is there, there are competition is there, and uh, people in the world understand now. You are, I understand, you understand. Right? The, when the whole dam was built, we, I and you mean, have no chance of understanding. We did not understand government. We did not have access to what government do. We do now. And you are talking about different world. So please, yesterday, not going back to yesterday, you want to go back to yesterday? It is easy. Going back to tomorrow? Is hard. Take me to tomorrow that you are talking about. You want revolution? You want okay, Raj, Raj, I, I want to remember that we are in a question period. So, do you have any other questions, real quick, to Matt? Real quick. If not, I'm going to move on. But thank you, Raj, for your comments. Okay. All right, uh, Jacob from NYC, you're on again. So, I'll go ahead and ask your question. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jacob. Okay. Okay, the youth electorate, those eligible to vote between the ages of 18 and 34 represent approximately 80 million. Okay. Um, part of the problem is that the young people, for the most part, are progressive. They want change. They, they're interested in environment, the environment, preserving it, right? But unfortunately, the reality is they're doing little to nothing about it. Now, just look at this group. Look how many people are in this group right now. How many belong to the youth electorate? One, not even one that I can see. I mean, is there one? So this is part of the problem. So the solution is we must begin with our family. We must begin locally to convert, to galvanize, those people who are apathetic. Hey, Jacob, this especially the youth. Okay, Jacob, real quick, you're going to get a chance to rebut in a rebuttal period. Do you have a okay, specific I'm gonna, question? Just let me finish one more sentence. So the solution is to um, uh, galvanize ten people. If you can't do ten, do five. If you can't do five, do three. Okay. Okay. Just don't do nothing, which is what okay. most people are doing. Little to nothing about okay. it all. They're just talking. All right, Jacob, do you want to rebut that answer real quick? Uh, Matt, did you want to rebut that answer? Uh, no, I actually agree. Um, you know, I'm part, again, of Democratic Socialists of America, where we have chapters in our community. And what, what, what we see as organizing is actually doing what he was discussing, talking to people and trying to win them over to our vision of politics, which is based on the idea that we need to basically overthrow capitalism if we want to survive as a society and that that takes talking to people and organizing them and getting them to do things in an organization that can build more political power so that's i totally agree with that um and i would also point out that this dsa was very aligned with the bernie sanders movement and that that demographic 1834 was voting for him in droves it was he's right. Jacob's right, though, that the the people above 34 voted much more at higher percentages and tended to vote no, no, uh, against. Can I just say one thing about that? Uh, yeah. Of the 80 million, only two million came out to vote for Bernie Sanders. No, you of cannot say million, anything about that. This is a question session. You can comment later and do all of that. Thank well, you. Right. Right. OK. Thank, thank you, Margaret, for that uh, thing. All right. Adel Censorship is alive and well. Or not, this is not censorship. You will have a chance to rebut. We'll each get a chance to uh, rebut.
rebut during our rebuttal period. You get a certain amount of time, and this is the question period, and then we will get a chance to rebut. I know it's a little bit different right now. All right, Adelson, Ad, Ad, how do you pronounce your name? Yeah, that's my uh, my last name for whatever reason. Eddie Just, Leon? Alan works. Alan, okay, Alan, you're next. Uh, go ahead and ask your question to our speaker. Right. Um, first off, uh, thank you for your lecture. Very interesting. I, I guess my question would be, where do we start? Uh, this country has absolutely zero class consciousness, which is what mm -hmm. you need to achieve mm -hmm. what, what you're trying to think of. Uh, the average American worker is lumping proletariat through and through. Mm -hmm. They identify more with their bosses than their fellow workers. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, New Deal was a great thing, but 80 years ago, we didn't have Fox News on every television. <laughs> so, so what's where what's what's the first step, basically? Thank you. Um, I I again can see that pessimistic view, and but but you know, I I there was a candidate that came very close to winning the Democratic nomination in, in um, 2016, 2020, who called himself Democratic Socialist and, and actually spoke in the, the idea of the working class needs to unite against the billionaires and the millionaires. And he was able to get millions of votes on that platform. But actually that gives me less optimism than what's actually happening in the country right now where you're seeing a, a, a resurgence of militancy amongst workers in, uh, basically union organizing. Um, you saw extraordinary um, victory of an Amazon labor union in Staten Island that won an election against one of the most powerful corporations on earth. They spend millions of dollars in, in anti-union busting consultants to try to stop that victory and they still won that victory. You've had a people organizing around Starbucks and other retail chains all across the country. There's going to be a um, UPS contract in 2023 and about 350,000 Teamster workers in that union are poised to go on strike. The, the rail workers might go on strike still. They have not voted to approve this deal that the Biden administration. So there's actually, you had the teacher strikes a few years ago where you know, a massive wave of teacher strikes organizing. So I think you're right, probably on balance that the American working class is still quite isolated, still quite weak, still lacks that class consciousness. But for the first time in my lifetime, I'm in my mid 40s, I see a little bit of an awakening and a little bit of activity and in, in action. So the question of where to start for me is, um, I think, um, if you don't have a workplace that you're in where you could conceivably organize a union and organize that class consciousness with your own work co-workers then um my neck my next option would be to join an organization like it doesn't have to be the democratic socialists of america but another kind of organization that's trying to raise class consciousness amongst the population and that's all we can do it's a, it's a huge uphill battle um but we're still in capitalism. We were in capitalism in the 1930s and we're in capitalism today. And as long as we're in capitalism, at least my view is that the working class has potential to be organized into an extremely powerful force because they ultimately, the whole society depends on them doing the labor and doing the work to keep society running. So they hold the power in their own hands, even though they haven't really been good at using it for the last several decades. All right. All right. All right, Rosalie, you're next. Unmute and uh, ask your question, please. Well, my question is, how can we get the unions to be the unions they used to be? Yeah, I, I was born in 1937, mm -hmm. the height of in Flint, Michigan, yeah. the height of the union movement. Yeah. Dorothy Day got into the... Um, uh, uh, factories. Um, the unions were powerful, but they pressed their pants. They joined the establishment. Mm -hmm. They have not been powerful. We have we have young people working to revitalize unions, and that's good. But how can we 
mobilize the unions to look beyond the immediate to the future. So in the in the Democratic Socialists of America and in the book, um, I draw from a, a, a basic strategy called the rank and file strategy, which argues that to revitalize the unions and turn them back into fighting unions, uh, you need to really energize the, the actual workers and rank and file members of those unions. And so the, the, the suggestion is that socialists should actually get jobs in specific industries, specific unions, and try to build a sort of militant layer of activists in those unions. And so that's what DSA is trying to do. They're encouraging members to get jobs as teachers, to, to try to radicalize teachers unions or nurses unions. Um, and again, in the book, I suggest maybe getting involved in the, the electricity sector, because since it's such a crucial sector for climate change, but it's gonna take, it's gonna take not enlightened trade union leadership to transform these unions. It's going to take sort of action from below, from the rank and file, to fight for um, changing the culture of the unions, which tend to be like our kind of society today, tend to be extremely top down. And the members and workers have become disillusioned with the unions because they're so corrupt and they're so captured. But to change that, you got to fight from below and build up energy uh and and so to to get fighting unions though the the workers need to experience struggle and see how if they fight they can win things so that's why i think like a big strike with ups next year with 350,000 workers that might go on strike if they see what they can win when they use their power by withholding them their labor they might actually get become more confident and we might see the labor union kind of wake up but or the labor movement wake up but yeah, it, it, it can look pretty bleak when you look at how corrupt and top-down and bureaucratic the unions are. And you've also not even talked about the fact that so many of the largest unions lost thousands of jobs. I'm talking AFL-CIO yeah. when they yeah. all went south. I mean, yeah. as a Michigan um, citizen, well, I, I live in Evanston, but I... My heart is in Michigan. I mean, to see the failure of the unions. Okay, Rosalie, again, so I'm going to have to interrupt here because we are trying to get several questioners in. We will have a chance to rebut okay. later on. I appreciate your asking your question again. So, uh, all right. And then thank you very much for bringing up a second round. Ernie, you're next. All right. I have a, a couple questions. I'll try and ask them quick and you can take pick one or both. With regard to electric, electrification of vehicles um, to eliminate the need for fossil fuels, what uh, the, the electricity has to be produced somehow. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that this whole business of switching to um, vehicles run with electricity is really is going to generate more pollution rather than less. Uh, unless we can switch totally to sustainable fuels. Is, is that your opinion or, or am, I, am I reading this wrong? Is there some way that uh, producing power with fossil fuels still is a better, it's better in that, in that it makes uh, electrical vehicles, which are you know, uh, better to, to drive with and around and so forth. But what's, what's the question on, or what's the answer on that is to, generating the most or most pollution nobody i've asked this question of many experts and they yeah. somehow avoid it no That's no right. that was what i was trying to explain all too briefly of the electrify everything strategy which is right, i remember you first right. you first have to completely clean up electricity that's priority number one that's why electricity is so central people call it the linchpin of any decarbonization strategy because you first have to transition. And that's what Joe Biden has pledged. He's going to create a zero carbon electricity sector by 2035. Now, I don't know if he still believes that with all the kind of stripping down of the climate program that's happened lately, but that's what he pledged to do. So if you can actually clean up electricity, then you electrify things that currently don't use electricity. And then if that electricity is, is clean, 
then you don't have to worry. I will say just briefly that um, even if the grid is powered by fossil fuels, it's there's less emissions if you you know use a battery powered vehicle um, versus literally combusting gasoline to propel your car forward. So yeah, I, I I don't understand that. You're saying that that electric cars. It seems to me that we're we're going at this wrong. We're electrifying vehicles before we're we're cleaning up the grid. But well, we're trying I don't to do understand both. that. If the power is created uh, using fossil fuels of one yeah. sort or another, and then the electricity has to be transmitted to where the charging takes place, yeah, and of you lose something like sixty or seventy percent of your of uh, mechanical efficiency in doing that, and a little bit of it uh, certainly in the charging. It seems I I don't I don't get that. Yeah, it's I I don't I'd have to dig up a study, but it's just literally thinking about how many pounds of emissions happen when you charge your battery and how yeah. far how many miles can you drive with that battery and then calculating like emissions per mile versus how many emissions come from your tailpipe when you're driving with a gasoline powered car and it turns out it's less when you're yeah, are, are there such studies out there yeah i'd like to see one yeah if you can forward one to charlie or that to one sure. of those guys that would be great my other question was uh you're saying that we should go to socialism but what about the fact that the uh, we, we've got a recent disaster and a disaster a little further back? The Soviet Union was socialist. They did do some good things, as you pointed out, such as electrifying mm -hmm. uh, the whole country. And they brought the country forward in many ways to being a world power. But nonetheless, that system eventually collapsed. And more recently, Venezuela. We had Chavez and Maduro, both of whom I admire in many ways a great deal. But that country is has just uh, become a basket case, and then they're basically trying to be socialists, right? Um, so how do you how do you uh, justify the notion that socialism is a better way to go? Well, a lot of socialists um, are very divided over whether or not we should even call the Soviet Union socialist. Um, I would agree with you that they did some pretty tremendous things, including being the the, the the crucial force in defeating the the Nazis in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they were, uh, you know, for me, I'm part of the Democratic Socialists of America. So my vision of socialism is fundamentally about democracy and they did not really democratize the economy in a way I would like to see. Um, but I think they did do things like economic planning that I think we need to revitalize if we're gonna i think that's the problem of climate change is basically one of planning we need a, a massively coordinated plan to kind of again completely transform our just our electric grid to start and then go from there and so learning about planning and how the soviets tried and failed at planning but how they tried to overcome their failures i think is useful um and Venezuela is a real problem because they base their socialism on the volatility of the price of oil because their entire economy runs on oil experts. And so when the oil price collapsed in 2014, just after Chavez died, uh, their economy went to crap and everyone thought it was Maduro's fault, but it was really just the, the, the crash of the commodity boom and oil prices. Um, and, you know, it's they did some other things to exacerbate those problems, you know, other like Bolivia was able to weather that crisis a little better. But um, ultimately, basing your socialism on the volatile price swings of fossil fuels is not a winning strategy either, although I also agree with you, they did some pretty good things they lifted a lot of people out of poverty during during the times when oil prices were high so okay well that's a discussion that will go on and on and on <laughs> we okay. won't solve it tonight all right charlie you got the last question and we're gonna go to rebuttals yes sir uh i've been a union official now uh over 40 years and to hard work and dedication rose to occupy the predominant position in labor union organization. I even at one time began a labor, brand new union that didn't exist previously. Now I come here tonight and I'm rather surprised to learn 
that I have been corrupted and captured. And I don't know <laughs> when that happened, but I know, seriously, I know of only one union official out of the thousands that I've encountered who was convicted of a criminal activity and she helped herself to maybe a few thousand dollars in union dues. Mm -hmm. Now, is that, the, that is the extent of the corruption that I am personally aware of. Now, I'd like to know when I went bad. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I really shouldn't be so, I, I think I was getting sort of wrapped up with the audience's negative views on unions. I actually love unions and I think they're often quite wonderful, but they can be quite corrupt. They can be captured. Can I they answer can... that? Yes, I please. just completely, every year I am audited completely by two parties, by the headquarters of my union, and I'm audited also by the Department of Labor. And I don't know how you could get away with anything after going through that twice a year. And believe you me, it is done and it's done rigorously. They come unannounced into my local and I keep the records all intact awaiting their arrival. And I've never had any, and believe you me, I, as evidence of that, I don't know how in the world, I guess you could do it. I don't know how, but that's just right. it. Let's go into uh, rebuttal periods now and uh, I'll give Let's everybody- Let's speaker. Yes, you're right. Let's thank our speaker. Okay, raise your hand if you want to rebuttal. Uh, Margaret, I know, has got one. I got one. And then I'll just go up as, as people raise their hands. If you don't know how, uh, let me know through the chat or something. But uh, I'll give everybody uh, five minutes. And Jacob at NYC, this is your chance to get your five minutes in on on unannounced. This is our rebuttal period now. I'm going to put a timer up on my screen here so that uh, everybody can... Uh, go with this stuff and I'll stick because if this is a lot of people wanting to speak tonight I'll kind of be very strict about the uh we'll just say six minutes for everybody that way we got a ch fighting chance to get everything in okay Margaret uh start your rebuttal and we'll give you six minutes where is the timer on the screen um I can put one on the screen I don't I don't oh know. I thought you said you did that's okay I no, don't know I, mean, okay. I got a timer on my other computer I'll, I'll give you a warning a nice warning okay Okay, um, first of all, I want to talk about the format. I hope Jacob sticks around. And I hope your speaker sticks around because sometimes people don't and they miss often some of the very most interesting parts of the pr presentation when they skip the rebuttal period. Um, and I don't know, I haven't seen him, Jacob before, but you know, maybe he's not used to the format here in a, in a lot of other, uh, uh, venues, what happens is, is that you put your comment in with your question and whatever, yada, 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 so that, you know, you take five minutes to ask a question if you, in fact, you ever get around to the question. Uh, the mm -hmm. second thing is that people do, to make the question understandable, sometimes people do do a small paragraph explaining their question, and that's acceptable. But but the thing is, is that the, the question period is for questions and answers. And, and, and that's different than any other format that you'll see. And I've been in the college a long time. And, um, and, and it really, oh, you left. Look at you. Oh, no, there you are. I'm sorry. Everything shifted around. And, and I found it an incredible learning experience. Um, for myself, well, for myself, period. So, and and my son actually too, for that matter. And and Frank um, learned a great deal from the college, and we've been coming literally for decades. So that's that. Second, in terms of um, a comment that was the other that I heard the other night on the college in Dallas was that. Um, uh, that. Uh, that the a, a working class has been totally abandoned by both parties, by Democrats and Republicans. We say the labor movement is a Democrat. Well, no, because the Democrats have abandoned the the the, the Republican the uh, working class just as thoroughly as the Republicans have, pretty much. So, um, and that's actually 
part of the impetus of, of all of these people that are that are organizing in the in the white supremacist thing and the and the Christian uh, theocracy, white nationalism, all that Christian nationalism thing. I mean, there's all kinds of names, but a, a huge part of that are people who are working class who haven't been able to go to college, didn't go yeah. because either they couldn't or didn't have the finances and um and couldn't get the finances and yada 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 so you know that's a that's a huge part of that resistance that trump appealed to and and that's who's that's who's supporting him for better or for worse and in my opinion for way worse the third thing i want to do very briefly is talk about uh, Tim's uh, obnoxious obsession with thorium first of all um, <laughs> nuclear power is hugely more expensive than any renewable sources. It's uh, orders of magnitude more expensive in terms of investment in facilities that they always have. The last two went like three or four times uh, more than they said they were originally gonna do and their original investment was billions of dollars and one they just canceled eventually. And it's also in terms of a timeline, it's, it's way more before you get a nuclear plant from the beginning to the end to, to be built like maybe 10 to 20 years than we have time for with uh with climate change so it's it, uh, it, the second problem is that is or the third problem is the nuclear waste that's generated there is no safe disposal of any of it that has a half-life of from, I don't know, 6,000 years or 28 days or whatever, to billions of years. There's no safe place to dispose of any of it. And even transporting it to a place is extraordinarily dangerous. I mean, everything about nuclear waste is extraordinarily dangerous and could lead to the obliteration of all life as we know it on Earth if there's an accident. I mean, the Russians bombing close to the facilities in the Ukraine was really a problem for a lot of people who understand what could really happen. And, and the, the fourth thing, the danger of the use of the facilities for terrorists, that they steal the stuff or they bomb the place. Someone pointed out that the nuclear power plants that are built around Chicago with an easy flying of uh, O'Hare, if, if a big enough airplane hit those they're they're made to resist up to a 727 or something well we don't have 727s anymore we have 787s or 28,007s or whatever and they're huge and they weigh a lot and if one of those hit a nuclear power plant this whole area would this the entire midwest would be grass one minute margaret nothing. so that's my comment good night all right, I'm going to go with Raj next. So Raj, you got uh, six minutes. Uh, go ahead and start and give your rebuttal. You got to unmute, Raj. Uh, I thank I thank uh, our speaker. I think I personally think that uh, it will be better off to spend more energy on a smaller project, and uh, which is technologically an evolution of our civilization is more tune with it, uh, but uh, this this kind of talks and this kind of thing, time is over. And as far as energy is concerned, I have no no worry about energy. And I think uh, our in investors and uh, innovators and scientists are working very hard and, uh, and uh, they'll take care of us. We have more and more energy and the and world is getting more people are getting energy and light and electricity, use of energy, electricity and everything. And I see that all over the world, there is a progress and progress is continues, okay? And uh, Africa, more people have energy today than there are five years ago, and five years ago, there are more people than there are 10 years ago. And, and I, I, I'm not worried at all. And with a new kind of, uh, what do you call it, uh, that, molecular atomic energy is coming, you know, and so we'll have plenty of energy, don't worry about it. 
unions gone. Okay, there, there, there is no possible structure you can build that uh, who are the workers? We, 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 can, we can manage the workers which are manual workers. We have managed the assembly line. But when, when we are using a brain workers, brain workers don't want to be, you know, controlled by others. You know, our, our uh, Charles, uh, for Charles knows, the federal government, or G, GAS or whatever, you know, they're doing a fine job. I mean, they're coming down, the president asked that he wants, a, he wants the details on a, this particular issue and how to do it, and they deliver to him. You know, and he said, my philosophy is this, that Trump goes and says, my philosophy is this, Biden goes and my philosophy is this, and they're able to do that. And that is a because brain and technology and cyber tech, are, we can do that. And corporations are doing that. So the so question is, the, the coral brain workers, like a cattle, as the union used to do it, it's no longer, no longer feasible. The, those days are gone. So let, 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 let's, let's move on. And uh, we have a serious problem. And other problem is that the, the technology getting so complex and so huge, and our problems are so complicated. We are not able to handle complexity. And that is a problem. And uh, someday they have to resolve and find that. How do we not create things so complex that we cannot, we cannot understand? Right now, the, 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 my, my biggest problem is, my personally biggest problem is that, that uh, I did not keep with the uh, time and I cannot handle telephone. My, my, my godson is able to do that. He can, he does everything on his telephone and I cannot do it. But you know, lots of people are like that. And people are not very well educated. And lots of those people not, cannot do it. And other thing happening is that, that uh, we have to make them everybody able to do the work like on a computer. In India, India I think that people are doing better with their managing everything on their, on their what do you call it, telephone. And uh, the, that is the future. Farmers are able to do that. The small woman in a small town now, she is able to talk into everybody on the world on a, and she's managing everything, transferring money, everything, doing it. But, but the, uh, people won't take a knowledge it's like a, they, have, they become a guard. They cannot be controlled. Thank you. I'm done. All right, Raj, uh, Charlie, and I got uh, Ernie Norman next, and then I'll go to Charlie. So Ernie, go ahead and unmute. You got six minutes. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted here. Yes. Uh, first of all, Matt, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. I may try and look up your book. I think your presentation was well put together but you probably had a good book to use as a guide. So that probably made it easier for you. And I suspect you make this presentation in other places as well. Uh, and uh, anyway, it, it, I found it uh, interesting and enlightening. Uh, as far as sources of pollution, uh, I'm involved with a very small group now that we're hoping to grow uh, entitled uh, uh, Climate Justice. And one of the th conclusions that uh, somebody has given us some of the data is that six up to 69% of pollution from energy, from creating energy or using energy uh, has to do with buildings, heating of buildings. Now, I'm not sure if that 69% uh, figure is correct. We usually think of it as being, you know, cars spewing uh, CO2 into the atmosphere, but I think that's really a relatively uh, small source. And transportation as an industry and as a group is working hard on this. I go to lectures by the Chaddock Institute here in Chicago, and there are different people doing things all over the world, including uh, electric uh, buses, which, which recharge a little bit at each stop by having a, a charging unit uh, in the street. Uh, things like this, a lot of very creative things are going on. Uh, it will take a while, there's, there's no doubt about, but, but at least people are thinking uh, along the right lines for that. And as far as industry, um, yeah, industry does pollute some. Uh, I think that the fact that we've lost so many jobs um, 
over to overseas, we we push some of the pollution overseas. Of course, uh, it's one atmosphere and one ocean that serves the whole world. So that doesn't necessarily do a lot of good for us, and it certainly doesn't do it for the people who are taking over, uh, taking over the business of making things. Uh, and as far as socialism, uh, I'm a Democrat. I'm, I'm a pretty liberal Democrat, supporter of Bernie Sanders for the last several years. Haven't voted for a Republican a major race in more than 30 years. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm definitely not a socialist. Now, socialism is gaining here in Chicago. I think we have the liberal coalition here in Chicago has at least 10 members, maybe more now. And some of them are avowed socialists and they and they don't they're not embarrassed to say it anymore. So we are moving in that direction. I think that we do need um, any major government, ours and any major government of any city or even smaller entities is at least part <laughs> socialist, even if we don't admit it. Many aspects of what we do through our government are essentially socialist libraries, schools, police, fire, infrastructure. Uh, those are essentially uh, built on a socialist model. Um, and I, the question becomes, what percentage of our GDP do we really want uh, to go through government entities as opposed to going through uh, private entities? And as a whole, those of us who are capitalists, and I'm a capitalist too, uh, believe that, that you get more done, you get more creativity and more efficiency efficiency from privately owned entities, generally speaking, but that doesn't mean that we, there's not a place for uh, publicly controlled entities using a kind of a socialist model. And I think that uh, as compared to the rest of the world, we have a smaller uh, amount of socialism and we need a little bit more. I think we need to go in that direction a little bit more, but not, for, not, not all the way. Uh, the, most of the standard of living that we have is due to uh, the free market system over the decades. They gave us most of the, the things that work uh, for us. So uh, I don't agree with the socialist part of your talk, but I think I do agree with you that it's a very serious problem. The environment is a very serious problem and we do need to work on it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dan and Eliana, uh you're next, Dan, if you want to speak. Uh, Charlie, I know you put your hand down because you normally go last, but Dan, you're up and uh, go. let's uh, get you speaking next. Okay. Interesting talk, Matt. So, so uh, XR and Science Rebellion are um, two activist groups and people have to get off the couch and join these groups. You can't just complain and sit and watch TV. So you don't have to be arrested when you go with XR. You can be a marshal, you can work with the food, you can do other support. You don't have to get arrested. As far as uh, Ukrainians bombing Zaporoz Zaporozhia, the nuclear plant, it wasn't the Russians, it was the Ukrainians. Wasn't. They're, they're a little out of control. And as far as Chase Bank supporting uh, lending money to oil companies, they've lent all, over $350 billion the last 10 years. So, uh, Banks have to be informed, <laughs> and that's why. That's why. Can you mute your, uh, Ernie? Mute your mic. Thanks. Uh, Chase Bank. Everybody can take their money out of Chase Bank if they can afford it. If they don't have a mortgage on there, if you can take it out, that'd be very helpful. XR has done dyings in front of Chase Bank and the Science Rebellion people in Los Angeles, they, they glued themselves to the front door of Chase Bank. And of course, well, I'm telling you about it, but there was no mainstream media about the gluing of Chase Bank. And as far as ExxonMobil, 
knowing about global warming. They knew about global warming in the 1970s. They knew the temperature was going to get higher because of oil, oil drilling and oil in cars. They knew that, but they didn't do anything. They don't care. All they want is money. They like, they're addicted to money. So ExxonMobil has papers that say global warming was gonna happen. And this was 50 years ago. And of course, like the tobacco companies, they knew about cancer and cigarettes 50 years ago and they did nothing. They're, corp they're called corporate criminals. And we're running, we're, we're in a, we're in a country that's co controlled by corporations now, unfortunately, but there are Starbucks, McDonald's, Walmart, Amazon, and Google, they're making unions now. They're trying to make more and more unions, and that's good. When Starbucks has 100,000 workers and 20,000 Starbucks, when there are 15,000 McDonald's, that's a lot of workers to organize. And, they, and they're not any more UAW workers or mine workers. These are the new, new workers. Uh, Amazon, Starbucks, Walmart, Amazon, and I said on Amazon, Google. These are big, big companies that can be unionized and be very strong. And last but not least, Europe is going to be cold this winter. And so they won't be burning a lot of fuel. So that, that'll be good for the atmosphere for a little while, at least. But thanks for your talk. That's all I got. Okay, uh, Rosalie, you got your hand raised. You got six minutes. So uh, go ahead and uh, start your rebuttal. Rosalie, you got to unmute. Um, I just think we need to redirect our priorities um, governmentally with our taxes, including tax resistance. But I think we have to not be afraid to be arrested, not be afraid to um, engage in civil disobedience, not be afraid to trade to the streets. I'm a little old to risk this, um, but I've written about that a lot. And, you know, we can at least be flagships yes. for change because um, there are so many divisions in our country today that the people that you read and I read aren't the same things that are still thinking that climate change is a myth or whatever. Um, and we're so divided. And the only way we can get people together is to get them off the internet, get them off their cell phones, get them out in the streets. Amen. <laughs> is that it, Rosalie? All right, I'm going to move on now to our ever illustrious uh, bloviator, Charlie Paydock. And Matt, you will get the last word tonight. So just hold on, okay? All right, uh, Charlie, bloviate away. Okay, I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. And uh, I'd like to thank our speaker for uh, giving us a unique perspective and presentation tonight. Any unique perspective, and invite him back again anytime with a, a further discussion on this. Um, cover five issues. I'll be eclectic as usual. Number one, I have to applaud our speaker. I thoroughly agree with him that we need, now Comrade Lennon uh, tragically suffered a stroke and passed away right at the onset of the revolution in Russia and never was able to fully implement his policies. I think we can achieve that fruition here in the United States, as I believe he was proposing. I think that's an excellent idea. Let's move forward and what he calls the transition. They, they had wonderful things uh, to change the society of that country in a brief period. And there's no reason we are incapable of doing so for again in this country at this 
onset of the new country. Uh, okay, that takes care of that. Uh, regarding uh, the union workers, there is no union member in the petroleum industry, the nuclear coal is not aware that the time, the clock is ticking on those occupations. They do not need to be educated in that regard. They're fully aware of it and they may put up some resistance or reluctance to uh, with this change that's in progress, but they <coughs> are fully cognizant of uh, what's in progress regarding the, the, again, the transition. Number three, the Democratic Party has not abandoned uh, the working people of the United States. I've been lobbying Congress for many years, representing different organizations and different issues. When I put on my union hat and request a meeting, I generally get a meeting. I always, usually always get a meeting with the Democratic representative congressmen themselves. Uh, other lobbyists are somewhat mystified how I have success in that regard, but they have by no means, Republicans just the opposite, but the Democrats at least have always been receptive to meeting with me, discussing and following through with implementation of the things that we would like to see implemented. Um, number four, um, I just wanna mention, I found it rather intriguing that the capitalist system has electricity for to power its sweatshops, but it appears does not have provide electricity for the people employed in those sweatshops, if I'm correct. But this is something I think I'm gonna look further into if there's any way to ascertain that. But that seems to be what capitalism does. Um, and um, last of all, regarding this nukes and nuclear fission, thorium, uh, towards the end of World War II, Adolf Hitler thought Germany was going to produce a wonder weapon and win the war. Well, as it turns out, obviously, they did not. They tried desperately uh, to take the lessons of the past <laughs> to say that there's some sort of wonder technology that is going to solve everything instantaneously is whimsical at best. Whims whimsical. There's a word for you, Tim. It's an authentic word, by the way. All right. Thank you again, Matthew. Please come again sometime. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to do my quick rebuttal. Okay. First off, uh, Matt, I think you got a lot of the climate change things right by knowing that about the various energy sources. And I believe the only way that we're going to get off oil is through some form of nuclear power. The problem is today we have what we call the light water reactor, which is a rather crazy way of doing nuclear power. It was invented by Admiral Rickover when he had the submarine and it just got scaled up. Why are we using it? Because they were the uh, company that did the first costs. We all know, for example, that Windows is not the best operating system for a computer, but about 90% of them run it worldwide because he was the guy who had the first costs involved. The thing is, is that there's a different kind of a nuclear power out there. One, the first off, the reactor is quite fundamentally different. It works on molten salts as a coolant versus light versus heavy water, which means you don't need all the uh, shielding that you would need with a light water reactor where the pressure of water is over 400 times atmospheric pressure. If you could run this at atmospheric pressure with molten salts, you'll be much better off in, in the cooling and the heating and everything else. The second thing is, is that uh, thorium is a proven technology. They have, they ran a demonstration reactor from 1957 through about 1968 at, at the Oak Ridge Laboratories. And that was all thoroughly documented by the government. In 1973, they shut the project down in favor of what was called uh, breeder reactors, like in Clinch River, where we wasted about $8 billion. As of right now, the commercialization of thorium power is being achieved right now in China. They just opened up a demonstration reactor in uh, November of last year, and they're planning now on building more out. 
because China knows what they're doing. They need to get these thorium molten salt reactors out. And the thing is, is that all they got to do is license them. And that's just the last thing we need is another thing from China. America right now is also starting to finally come around and build them as they're finally opening up the uh, nuclear regulatory commissions, finally getting out of its uh, seeds to get it going. The second thing is, is that, you know, capitalism works. We've been at this for well over 300 years, and it's provided the biggest and best means of prosperity through the world. Now, Matt, I don't know if you're familiar with a uh, with a with a project called the uh, humanprogress.org uh, website, but it's a it's a graph that tells you what human progress has been made, especially over the last 50 years, in the form of illiteracy being reduced lifespan being elongated and the amount of abject poverty that's been reduced throughout the and world. And child labor. Don't forget child labor, Tim. Well, Charlie, like I said, you know, it, it's my time. So, you know, they're, they're, a lot of these developing countries get capital in there. They start getting people off the fields and in a better jobs. They start moving into cities. They start integrating with the world economy. And that goes. The thing is, right now, we're having a problem with trade around the world because of this increasing um authoritarianism that we're seeing around the world and i'm afraid that if we don't stop it we might be back to where we were right before world war one however the thing is climate change can be solved and it's going to be through the introduction of a widespread power source called nuclear and i don't think i can see anything else to where it's going to replace like i said 20 percent of our electricity in the united states is being developed by it france made the decision back in the 70s and 80s to go almost all nuclear so they can get off oil. And the simple fact of the matter is there are ways of dealing with nuclear waste. It's called recycling and it's called burning it off in other types of reactors. A lot of those long-term actinides can be taken care of inside a, one of these thorium reactors so where we can get the waste uh, sequestered for about 400 years. Now, if you want to know more about it, uh, go to the Thorium Energy Alliance website uh, where there's an organization out in Harvard, Illinois, that will tell you all about it. As a matter of fact, I've been to a number of Thorium Energy Alliance conferences, and I have been very sold on the idea of that it's probably the only way that we'll ever get out of this climate change. Yes, I know we have electric power, I know we have fossil fuels, and I know we want to do better for everybody around the world. And the only way I think that's going to happen is with the amount of investment it's going to take and the amount of things like this, it's still going to be a lot cheaper in the long run to build a centralized power plant and it will be to retrofit the entire grid for renewables. If you're wondering why I'm a little bit think that the renewables are a scam, Mark C. Jacobson did a study. He said that how we could get off the world and make it nuclear and carbon free. Well, there was another, there was another uh, report that thoroughly debunked him called the Roadmap to Nowhere which you can go download from the site and was presented again at one of the Thorium Energy Alliance conferences. I do believe that you've got some of it right, but I don't think it's going to be a socialistic revolution. I honestly think that when we get some government government backing for the initial research in the thorium reactors, once we start getting the uh, critical mass of investment, they're doing it. I know right now of two companies that uh, are doing this. One is called Thorcon. They're operating in um, Indonesia right now to put a reactor on a ship, one of these molten salt reactors. And there's another guy out of Italy. He's trying to build one about the size of a shipping container, which can be transportable and power almost anything anywhere. Yes, I know that nuclear is dangerous. We're going to have to deal with some of the waste and issues along that and get institutions to where we grow, which we won't be accustomed. But again, you know, when you put gasoline into a car, you're not going to think about how much napalm you're going to make, but how much fuel you'll put into it. And a lot of times I think the uh, nuclear energy is probably one of the most safest forms of energy made as far as that's per kilowatt. And as far as, yes, we do have some, we've had had some disasters, but they were both because Chernobyl was a, didn't have any shielding. Um, Fukushima was not built, to, the seawall was not built up high enough to get in there. And then, of course, the time when we had Three Mile Island, it was a, still a new technology and they still didn't have the proper safeguards in there. But we do, we do learn and we do go. I mean, if you look at the aviation industry with the National Transportation Safety Board, they do know how 
to keep aircraft safe. And the thing is, if we manufacture jet planes at about one a month out of, uh, at least out of, uh, you know, Boeing and all these other things, and we make these fantastic stuff like an iPhone and everything else, surely we could uh, put these reactors into mass production and make them safe. With that, uh, I believe that capitalism will ultimately prevail because it has been proven to be the best way to get people prosperous over the last few number of years. I will say this, though. American capitalism has gone a little bit wrong. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the, 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 the daughter of the Disney. I think her Abigail Disney, her name is. And she was saying that one of the things that's went wrong with American capitalism and why socialism is working is that we have broken the fundamental contract with our workers. Used to be you get a job, you get a pension, they take care of you, you'd have health care, and now it's all cost reduction, all cogs in a wheel, maximum profits, and there's no human factor involved with it again. Either we clean up capitalism, get it more humane, or we will be socialist. End of story. Thank you very much for listening to me. Should I jump in? Um, are there any more rebutters tonight? Okay, Matt, you'll get the last word. And what will happen is that you can take as long as you want. Oh, Adelon, you want to do a rebuttal real quick? Uh, yes. Um, okay, obviously... then I'll, I'll, give you six, I'll give you six minutes, so go ahead and start. Yes, uh, obviously socialists, so I have to disagree with you mostly on, on your points, Tim. Uh, one thing you're completely right about is that nuclear is statistically the safest form of energy generation. It's, it's just been, uh, <clears throat> its name has been dragged through the mud because of Chernobyl, because of uh, Fukushima, but those were outliers. I'm from New York. Pollution kills a million people a year as a byproduct of fossil fuels, for example, and we don't really consider that as a reason to abandon fossil fuels. Uh, that aside, to, to my main point, um, I guess I just find it hard to not be a, a nihilist about it. We call it uh, Joker pill. World's shot, world's burning. There's nothing we can do anymore. Accept it. Live life to the fullest otherwise. It's uh, good to, to come places here, places like here, learn a little bit. Uh, your, um, Matt, your book is actually kind of interesting. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it. But for the most part, nothing's going to change, man. System must have burned down before it gets better. Maybe we'll survive, maybe, maybe not. By that point, who, who will really care? I'll probably be dead. So, man, we'll see. Thank is you. That, is that all you did, Dan Ellen? Okay, Matt, you get the yeah. last word and uh, unmute. And you, the floor is yours for the rest of the night till we adjourn. So go ahead. <sighs> All right, so I have to admit it's an hour later here. I'm pretty tired, so I'm right. going to try to be brief, um, but I'm not very good at being brief. So, But anyway, thank you all for having me. It was really interesting discussion and great to get all your feedback. And um, if you don't mind, since some people did mention it, I will put a link to the book in the chat just in case it's pretty cheap you can get it for like 14 15 bucks so why don't you share a screen and plug it too while you're at it okay let's see where is that if you go to the our website it's on the september schedule sorry that's Lennon. The there you go okay oh thank you thank you um charles for putting that link there so quickly margaret um Actually, I agree that I'm going to take your thing down while you so you can speak. OK, but thanks a lot for. Uh, I, I agree that the Democratic Party has largely abandoned the working class. There's a great book by Thomas Frank called Listen Liberal, how the Democrats have become a party of the professional class. And they now form their base amongst more affluent, college educated, suburban, often populations. Um, I think Charlie's right, though, that there's still a big base of union and working class people that are still in the Democratic Party. Um, the big problem is a lot of the working class is abandoning the Democratic Party for the Republicans. And 2016, 2020, you, uh, you saw more and more non-college educated 
largely working class people shifting to vote for Trump. And, and in 2020, it was even, you know, big increases amongst Latinos and African Americans shifting toward Trump. Still, those populations were largely for the Democrats, but they're shifting, right? Okay, I should talk about nuclear very quickly. Always it's said to be way too expensive um, compared to solar and wind, which are so cheap, but no one ever talks about that solar and wind fundamentally cannot do what nuclear power can do, which is deliver 24 seven reliable power. If you build solar and wind, you need storage, which essentially you need what's called long duration storage, which doesn't exist at commercial scale now. So when people build renewables now, they have to back up those renewables uh, with natural gas plants. And that's what's happened um, in California and Germany, basically. And we see what happens in Germany. Um, uh, so you can't just compare the cost of them as if they're delivering the same type of, of electricity. They're not, they're fundamentally different technologies. Um, also the length of, to build nuclear plants, true, it takes a while, but also if we want to, if we, the other thing we need, if we want to build solar and wind is we need massive new transmission lines and to connect all the solar and wind. So when the sun isn't shining, the wind isn't blowing, you can have solar and wind generating somewhere else but take building transmission lines in this country takes a long time it takes like there's all these you know uh, resistance to it regulatory hoops you got to jump through it takes seven to ten years to build one of these lines so it's going to take a lot of time to build a new energy system in general and that shouldn't stop us as we heard from tim france basically decarbonized their electricity sector in about 10 to 15 years with nuclear. Um, they were able to do it pretty quickly. And they, since they used the public sector to build it out, they are able to deliver cheap, cheap electricity. It's not, no one worries about the high cost of nuclear in France because the public sector took on the expense. And then once it's built, it's actually incredibly cheap. Um, the waste problem, you know, is not really, I mean, it's it's worrisome because it is dangerous material, but we know how to deal with it. You know, you can put it in these casks and, 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 and no one can get to it. And you literally have to eat this stuff for it to be really dangerous. And um, uh, no one's really died from it. We've figured out how to deal with it. Um, but of course, we need to figure out ways to communicate to future generations that it's dangerous. And that's kind of a challenge when you think about how will our language and culture travel and things like this. Okay, I'll just quickly keep going. Raj, um, the only thing I want to say back to Raj is that he said that investors and innovators will take care of us. And I just don't think there's a lot of evidence with that on the climate problem. You know, emissions keep going up and up, and we keep being told that capitalist and technology will save us and it's just not happening and it things are getting worse you know one third of pakistan was flooded uh, a couple weeks ago there's these increasing storms drought in the west fires thing i mean the planet is really being severely destabilized and we keep being told that elon musk <laughs> and all these innovators are, are going to save us and it's just not happening so my, my fundamental case for socialism is not um, even that we need a revolution, it's that we need a production system for our energy that is not profit oriented, that because we need to actually say, we need to build this energy system to save the planet, regardless of if it's profitable. And the fact is our energy system, they only build energy systems if it's profitable to do so. And, and I and maybe thorium reactors that Tim's talking about will get commercially profitable and they can just go like wildfire. But that's not the case right now. And in fact, Margaret's right that the reason we won't build nuclear plants because it's not really profitable to investors. And that's the problem. So socialism is is the idea that we should produce stuff for social need and for and human flourishing and not just for if, if, if it's profitable for investors. The point about how complex our society is, again, the 20th century was a century of 
complexification of society. And, and there's been various forms of state and public investment and planning and labor movements that have been able to direct our societies in coordinated and conscious ways, regardless of how complex it is. Um, so I don't think complexity is like an excuse for not doing anything or not trying to take control of these problems. Ernie, um, I would check that data about 69% of pollution being rooted in heat for buildings. Although if that's true, it's really exciting because we know how to solve the heating for buildings problem with these new exciting heat pump technologies. And so that if that's true, that there's a real good solution to that. Um, I still in the United States, we do still have a lot of industry actually that pollutes a heck of a lot. We just don't see it in our everyday lives. There's still a lot of factories, a lot of you know manufacturing output went has gone up over the last few decades. It's just through automation that employment has gone down. So we've kind of deindustrialized production through automation, and of course moved some of it overseas. But a lot of it has stuck around. It's just been incredibly automated, and and the fact that it's automated means it's very energy intensive and still pollutes quite a bit. And the United States still has, if I recall, I think about a third of our energy consumption is industry. So, and, and, and for the world, it's like 50%. So industry is really, really kind of the core driver here. Um, but industry, like you said, can be offshored. You can move a car factory to Mexico or China but the thing about um, electricity is it can't be offshore, right? It it's a grid has to be regional and has to be part of a society. So the fact that workers in that electricity system, it's similar to labor activists say you can't offshore hospitals and schools so that it's good to build worker power in those places because they can't just shut down and move the factories to China. They have to deal with the workers in the schools similar for electricity. Um, Norway is a good model of a, a society that has a huge proportion of its GDP in public ownership, but yet is a capitalist country and is able to deliver a pretty substantial welfare state where people are happy and healthy um, and um, have their basic needs taken care of, but there's still private ownership of the means of production. So that's probably kind of a middle example. You know, the United States is just, it's, it's pathetic how much suffering and material deprivation we put up with. There's parts of the South that don't even have modern sewage uh, right now and are dealing with hookworm, the return of hookworm, these parasitical um, diseases that have come back to poor parts of the South because we have not invested. You saw a few weeks ago, Jackson, Mississippi doesn't even have basic water infrastructure. This is in the richest country on earth. It should just not be one of the most booming industries in our cities are blood plasma don donation where impoverished people can get paid to donate blood uh, several times a month. And that's become a huge, and these blood plasma donation centers locate in the poorest parts of cities because they know that people will go and donate blood. And this is a booming, we, we export more blood plasma from the poor in this country than we do soybeans. So this is an incredibly unequal, barbaric country where people don't have, like a lot of people are so impoverished that it, we shouldn't put up with it. And that's the, the case for something better, right? Um, I gotta move much quicker. I'll just say to Dan that I agree with all the excitement around unions and Starbucks and Amazon. I won't agree with Dan on the fact that it's good that Europeans are going to be cold, <laughs> that they're going to consume less energy because they're going to not have enough natural gas. That that worries me. I have a much more optimistic. I'm closer to Tim on this, where I think we can solve these energy problems. We can decarbonize them and then make it so humans can have as much energy as they need to have a good life. Um, and so um, we don't need to just hope that they get their energy cut off and freeze to death. And that's good for climate change. That's not good. Rosalie, um, I really admire the, the, the history and focus on civil disobedience, and there's so much to learn. You might be interested, and you might try to get this, this guy to speak in your group. 
But this guy, a friend of mine named Andreas Mom, wrote a book called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. And he makes this pretty strong argument that if you look at the history of many social movements from the suffragette movement to the civil rights movement, they actually had more violent forms of property destruction and, and, and violent insurgent type of activity that made those movements powerful and effective. And he argues the climate movement needs that kind of violent property destruction element. And, and, and he argues against the, the tradition that is more hegemonic in the climate movement, which is civil disobedience, we can win via nonviolence. So if you're interested, that book will get you to think about things differently. I go back and forth about the internet and whether or not it is inherently going to be something that is against us uh, or is always dividing us and isolating us, as, as Rosalie is suggesting. The West Virginia teachers who went on strike organized their strike via Facebook groups. And so there's ways in which the internet can actually bring us together. We're, we're very isolated geographically. You know, the labor movement was built because we were all came to cities and worked in factories and we're all concentrated then to, to deal with that, uh, that movement, you know, society decided to disperse us all in these isolated suburban decentralized ways of living. Maybe the internet can bring us back together in kinds of ways. Charlie, I didn't feel like you had much of a rebuttal. You just had a five really nice points. So I don't have much to say. I thought you made five very good points. So um, I agree with you. The clock is ticking for a lot of these unions. And I think they need to be aware of that. And they need to fight to, to keep their unions alive by fighting for them to be part of this green transition towards climate change. Tim, I'm a nuclear advocate, but I don't know a lot about all these different technologies. All I do know is there's big debate on Twitter. There's a lot of people that think light water reactors are great. That we they're, we know how they work. They're they're proven. We should just build those, and they're we we know that they're proven. And there's a lot of others that think we need new technology. A lot of people arguing for small modular reactors and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I'd love to learn more about these thor thorium reactors, and they all sound cool. I will say that the one thing that would really solve everything is not fission, but fusion, right? If we can really figure out fusion, it actually solves all the waste problems. It solves, it, it provides limitless energy. It could be really, if you want abundance and energy for all, fusion's the way, but we keep being told it's like 20 years away to get to fusion. Um, I, again, I don't think capitalism should be given all the bona fides for human progress. I think um, we have to um, we have to give a lot of that. Yes, some capitalists have been very good at innovating technology and, and creating material um, accumulation of wealth that has trickled down in certain ways. But I think a lot of the progress we've experienced have come from, again, labor movements and other movements fighting for human rights and fighting for progress and human betterment that needs to be given. And, and oh, by the way, a lot of these socialist countries with all their warts and all were able to deliver a fair amount of human progress, you know, ra massively raising literacy rates, giving universal health care to everyone, all that kind of stuff was was able to be achieved under socialist dictatorial, yes, but socialist countries. Um, Cuba has some of the highest levels of human development indicators like healthcare and education. Um, so it's it's complicated. Mar I agree, Mark C. Jacobson is a really problematic researcher and I'm, I'm, I'm um, kind of uh, depressed that he keeps getting like, I just, just a week ago, there was an anti-nuclear piece in the New York Times that cited him and he, he should, I think he, I would have thought he'd be discredited by now, but he hasn't been. Um, so is it Alan at the end? So um, I would be lying if I don't feel those nihilistic, uh, depressing thoughts as well from time to time. Um, I, I have a hard time. I try to fight those feelings, though. I want to believe. And in the end, I actually um, try to believe that humans are good and we can come together and build a better society. And there's a lot of historical experience that shows us there are examples of that happening. I also have 
one of the reasons if you ever got the book it's dedicated to my daughter um, who was born in 2015 she's seven years old she's going to reach retirement age in 2080 and uh i have a hard time um just thinking with her on uh, with the stakes for me are her you know and so i have a hard time thinking like we're all gonna burn and die and it's just like whatever right so i feel like we have to fight um it's cliche but we have to fight for for our kids and our our, our the planet's future for them and we have to believe we can create a better world because people have done it over and over again throughout history it's just we're in a tough uh period of maybe 40 50 years where there hasn't been the capacity for particularly on the left for movements to actually win and build and do things but we should realize that history doesn't just always it's not always the same it changes there can be big shifts and revolutionary upsurges that can really shift things very quickly so we have to be ready for that and try to organize for those moments so i'll stop there thank you all Okay, and I'm going to stop the recording now for the College of Complexes. Thank you, everybody, for uh, a good night. I'm uh, going to uh, keep the Zoom call open for a while, but I may 